Although it was a number of years ago, I vividly remember the afternoon when we went to the backyard, my mom and my dad and myself and my two older sisters and my younger brother, and we watched as the flames of the fire began to crest over the last hill and coming down toward the houses, not all that far from where we lived. If you have ever watched the Rose Bowl or the Rose Parade and you see those hills up behind there, that's uh, where I grew up. And uh, the fire was coming down the hill and all of a sudden the embers started to fall upon our, our home and, and uh, the ashes began to fall upon our home. And we had the, the shake, wood shake roofs and so my dad went into action. I was in fifth or sixth grade, somewhere around that time frame of my life. And uh, my dad decided we're going to get up on the roof to, to save the house. And at the same time, our next door neighbor, who was good friends of, of ours, they had just moved and the new people hadn't moved in yet. And so he said, okay, son, I want you to get a hat on. I want you to get some sunglasses and we're going to get your hose and get up there to the top. And, and what you're going to do is just spray down this roof and, and spray it down. So when you see an ember, you know, you douse it right away and just try to get this roof as wet as you can, as long as you can, um, so there won't be any damage. And so I got on, on the neighbor's roof, he got on our roof, and for hours we were up there and just with, you know, our hoses watering down the roofs. And I never felt so much like a man in my life, you know. <laughs> Here I am, I'm like a fireman, and I'm like fifth or sixth grade. And, and after that all happened and our homes were, were saved, um, I got a nice uh, card from the, the neighbors who had moved with a bunch of gift certificates to Baskin Robbins. It was all good from beginning <laughs> to end. Um, but, you know, when, when a... A potential situation of doom hits you, what are you going to do about it? Are you just going to just go on with life like normal, or are you going to actually do something about it and, and get prepared and get ready for what could possibly happen? I mean, let's just say you owned a, a beach place um, in Florida, and the hurricane was about to hit in the next day or two. Are you just going to go on with life and go back to work, or are you going to board up your home and get supplies and get out of town? Or if you know somehow you got tipped off that like a half hour from now, there was going to be somebody who's going to go rob your house. Are you just going to sit here and listen to a sermon? Or are you going to get out of your seat and, and get to your place and call the police and protect your stuff? Or maybe if you went to a, a doctor this last week and the doctor says, hey, you're a heart attack waiting to happen. If you don't get in here and have surgery in the next few days, there might be you know, catastrophic a future for you. So get a surgery. Are you just going to go back to work and go back to normal life? Go back to school? Or are you, or, or are you going to go get, get a surgery done? I mean, when there's pending doom coming, there needs to be some kind of a, of a response to it, an awakening to it, and, and a preparation to get ready for it, right? Well, we've been looking the last many weeks at, at the subject of the, the coming of the end of the world. And Jesus promises that he is going to come back. But it's amazing how many people aren't prepared for it. Don't think about it don't want to think about it, or even followers of Jesus Christ who really are, are not prepared in any way for this. But Jesus is going to tell us today that we need to be ready, and we need to be prepared. And I want you to take your Bibles and turn them to the Gospel of Luke to chapter 21. To Luke chapter 21. If you don't have a Bible, we do have Bibles provided and you can turn that to page 881, and you'll get to this passage. And if you don't own a Bible, uh, we really want you to take that home and for it to be uh, your Bible. Let me review for us where we've been the last two weeks as we continue to go through the Gospel of Luke, verse by verse. We're getting near the end of it now, and Jesus is addressing the, the things of the end of time. He is in Jerusalem with his disciples. It's the last few days of his life before he goes to the cross. And while he is in this uh, location, we learn in verses uh, 37 and 38 that we'll look at in just a moment that every single day in these last days of his life on, on earth that he went to the temple and taught and then the disciples and him went to the Mount of Olives at night and slept and that is literally right across the ravine. It's a very short walk from one to the other. Verse 37 tells us, and every day he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went and lodged on the mount called Olivet. And early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear. So that was going on on a daily basis. And on one of those uh, evenings as they were leaving the Temple Mount to go to the Mount of Olives, as we saw a few weeks ago, some of the disciples made comments about the, the magnificence of the temple. 
its beauty, its size, its ornateness, uh, the, the, the massive stonework, uh, all the things that were a part of this temple that they, they're like, wow, look at this temple, Jesus. And Jesus surprises them by saying to them, yeah, that's impressive, but it's going away. It's going to be destroyed. And they're like, what? And so when they get over to the Mount of Olives, we learn that just a few of the disciples get with Jesus and they say, help us with what you meant. What were you talking about? And he began to tell them that, sure enough, in, in the near future, Jerusalem was going to be destroyed and the temple was going to be destroyed as well. And we find, find out through history that, sure enough, in 70 A.D., the uh, Roman Emperor Titus comes into Jerusalem, surrounds it, and then ultimately attacks it, destroys it, kills maybe about a million Jews. 100,000 are captured, taken off into captivity, and the temple as well is completely leveled. But while he tells them about what's coming right around the corner, he also uses this opportunity to share what's going to happen at the time of the end. And that certainly the world is going to come to an end and that he is going to return back again. And we've looked at two weeks ago the realities of the end times, that there will be false Christs and false predictions. We learned about the signs of the times that are going to come. And we learned uh, that there will be severe persecution for those who are followers of Jesus Christ. And then last week, I asked the question, why does there even have to be an end? I mean, why, why does God need to end the world? And we learned that God is a holy God. And because he's a holy God, his wrath is poured out against sin and against those who reject his son, Jesus, but that he's holding back on his wrath because he wants more people to be saved and to spend eternity in heaven. But there will be a day when he will say, enough, enough of this, enough of how this world is, enough of the sin, enough of the rejection of my son, and Jesus will come back and the world will end as we know it today. And what we look at today, the last part of the section, is known as the Olivet Discourse by theologians. The, the conversation on the Mount of Olives is what that means. At the end of this section, Jesus is basically telling us this. Jesus is returning, so be ready. He is going to return. That is a reality, so we need to be ready. And here's what I want to accomplish uh, today. I want to help us understand this passage, and then I want to talk to you from my heart about what is keeping so many of us from being ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I want to pray. If you'd bow with me, please. Lord, it's possible to be a follower of yours and not be ready for your return. To be so focused on other things that we don't have an urgency to our life. And, and Lord, I pray today that you would open up our understanding and also our hearts to what you have for us today. And that we would take this seriously and we respond accordingly. I'm going to pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at Luke, Luke 21, beginning in verse 29. And Jesus starts off with a parable. It's, it's about the shortest of all the parables in the Gospels. A parable is when Jesus makes up a story to make a point. And then remember, they're on the Mount of Olives, so there's trees all around them there at the Mount of Olives. And uh, he says, he told them a parable. He said, look at the fig tree and all the trees. So my guess is there was a fig tree right there, and there was a bunch of trees around. So he says, look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they come out in leaf, you see for yourselves and know that the summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Jesus is telling his disciples to pay attention to the signs and you'll be ready for his return. And he makes a very uh, basic analogy about, hey, when the, when the trees get their leaves, you know, right around the corner is, is summer. Right? I mean, that's pretty basic. We get that in Colorado. We have four seasons, although this year we wonder if we had uh, spring. We had a lot of snow in the spring. And one of the things that it did is it it kept us from having all those beautiful blossoms, the, the white blossoms and the pink blossoms. And so we didn't have spring like normal this year. 
I have mixed emotions about that because there's a part of me that misses that beautiful springtime and, and those weeks when everything is so vibrant and, and colorful. At the same time, we have at our house three uh, pretty decent-sized crab apple trees. And what this means is because they didn't flower, there will be no crab apples. And that means in the fall, there'll be nothing to drop on the ground that I don't have to pick up. So there's a part of me that's very happy about this uh, happening. But basically, all that Jesus is saying here, very basic, is that when you see the trees get the leaves, you know that right around the corner is summer. When you see the signs of the times, you know right around the corner is my coming. Therefore, be prepared. And we have already learned that Jesus has told us that the signs of the times are an increase in wars, an increase in earthquakes, an increase in famines, an increase in pestilences, um, unnatural disasters where like the cosmos start going crazy, and severe persecution to, to followers of Jesus, even to the point of, point of martyrdom. And, and if Jesus is coming back very soon or in the near future or even down the road farther, this is what we do know, is that certainly the signs of the times have heated up in the last many years. Even with technology and the things that are offered through technology and the, and the, you know, the chips that we could have and, and retina scans and all the things that we think about when we think of a, a mark of the beast and all those things that could happen, certainly we're closer now than we have been at any time in history, obviously, but things seem to be heating up. And so when you see the signs of the times, get ready. That's what he's saying. But then comes verse 32 and you kind of go, huh? Huh? What is he saying here? Because he says here in verse 32, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And so you scratch your head a little bit and you say this is confusing because the generation that Jesus is talking to is over 2,000 years ago now and he has not come back yet. And he says in this generation all these things will take place, but they didn't take place in that generation. So was Jesus mistaken? Did he, did, he, did he make an error there? And I have a theology that says Jesus is perfect and he doesn't make mistakes. So what did he mean by when he said this generation? And there's various viewpoints. Even some commentators think this is maybe the most difficult or one of the most difficult verses in all the Gospels to, to understand. <coughs> there's more viewpoints than this, but let me just give you three basic ones that, that people believe that what Jesus could be saying. Like, first of all, that Jesus is referring to that present generation of disciples and followers of him at that time. But he's not referring to the end of the world. He's referring to the end of Jerusalem as they knew it at that time. And, and the destruction of the temple that was going to end up happening in 70 AD. Which would be about 40 years past this time. And that's what he was referring to. Some people believe that. Others people, other people believe that Jesus is referring to the final generation. The very last generation on this earth that are going to be here for the end of time, although he does say this generation there. He doesn't talk about a future generation. And a third viewpoint is that the word generation is not so much referring to a stage of life of a few decades, but it's referring to an actual race of people because there are other times we find in the Bible when the word generation is used to talk about an entire race of people. And Dr. Philip Ryken writes this when he says, Sometimes the Greek word for generation, the word genea, refers to race, a group defined by ethnicity rather than by the year that it is born. And then he goes on to say that it is, if this is the way the term is used in chapter 21, then Jesus was speaking specifically about the Jews. They are the people who will not pass away from this earth until everything in God's plan has taken place. And I tend to think that that's probably what Jesus is referring to because also in verse 33 and in verse 36, the immediate context after this, he's talking about the end of the world and not the end of uh, Jerusalem. And we also know that Jerusalem gets you know, restored as time goes along. So I tend to believe that he is talking about the Jews as a people and they're going to be there all the way till all these things are fulfilled at the end. Be that as it may... The main point that he is making is this. He is coming back, so we better be ready. And when we get to verse 34, it reveals to us what's on his heart more than anything else. In fact, I would go so far as to say, as we've looked at this over the last few weeks, this chapter, that what Jesus, most important thing that he wants to say is the very last thing he says. He talks about in generic terms the, the signs of the times, the things that are coming. 
But then he wants to say more than anything else, I am coming back, and so you need to be ready. But what's interesting is when he starts off these last few thoughts from, from his heart, he says this to start it off. He says, but watch yourselves. But watch yourselves. He doesn't say watch the clouds for me coming back. He doesn't even say look and pay attention very closely to all the signs of the times, although he does want us to look at those. He says, but watch yourselves. Look at verse 34. Jesus said, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day come upon you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. It's going to come to everybody. But stay awake at all times, praying that you might have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. And I want to share with you what's on my heart today. In the last uh, few weekends as I've preached about the end times, I have really focused so much of my attention on those who are not followers of Jesus. And certainly those people need to, to hear that as well today about you need to get, you know, believe in Jesus so that you will have eternal life in him. But what's really on my heart today is to talk to those of us in this room, the majority of us that are, that are followers of Jesus. And I want to say, and even with the risk of offending, that my guess is there are a lot of people in this room who are legitimate followers of Jesus, who if Jesus were to come back today, you would indeed go to heaven. But you're not ready. You are not ready. You're not focused on his return, you don't even think about his return. It's not on your radar, sc radar screen at all. You are so focused on, on the things of this life and this earth that you don't even give the time of day of thinking of what it's going to be like to meet him and that it could be soon. And there's no urgency to your life spiritually. The New Living Translation puts verse, verse 34 this way. Watch out, don't let me find you living in careless ease and drunkenness and filled with the worries of this life. Don't let that day catch you unaware. And when we are not alert is when we put our guard down. And when we put our guard down is when we are susceptible to focus on things that aren't important and sometimes things that are even damaging. It's like a soldier who's out on night watch, night after night, and he hasn't seen any sign of an enemy, and after several nights of that, begins to drop his guard, begins to not be so focused and alert, and that's when the enemy can pounce. I mentioned this on the Saturday night message, and, and a, a man in our church who's a retired Army Ranger came up to me, and he said that one of the things that they stress highly for those who do watches and are on guard he called it, he said they tell him complacency kills. Complacency kills. If you begin to get complacent in, in, your, you know, in your position of being alert and, and watching, that complacency can, can kill. And I mentioned that then again in the last few services. And another retired Army Ranger came up to me after the last service. And he said there's one part you need to add to that. He says we're, we're taught stay alert, stay alive. Stay alert, stay alive. He says, but watch yourselves. My life verse, it's, when I say that, it's a verse that I've chosen that is very important to me. And I, I pray that it guides my life. And it's Proverbs 4.23. It says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Watch over, guard over the inner being of your life. The part of your life with the Lord. And watch over it diligently, consistently, regularly. For from that heart flows the very spring of life. And if you don't watch over it, you can have stagnation or even death inside your heart toward God. When it comes to the end times, why watch yourself? Why does Jesus say this? 
And Jesus answers this by saying in verse 34, Lest your hearts be weighed down. Or as the Good News Translation puts it, Don't let yourselves become occupied with. Become occupied with what? And Jesus says three things. To be occupied with dissipation, drunkenness, and the cares of this world. Dissipation, drunkenness, and the cares of this world. Now, dissipation isn't a word that we use much at all. In fact, I don't think I ever hear somebody say dissipation. But if you look at various translations, trans- this word is translated at careless ease, feasting, carousing, parties. Uh, dissipation is living life from one party to another, from, from one high to another. It is, it is living life to find satisfaction and fulfillment apart from Jesus. It doesn't have to be a party scene. It could be trying to fulfill yourself with sports, trying to fulfill yourself with recreation, trying to fulfill yourself through education, trying to fulfill yourself um, through through technology, through politics. And and you you that becomes your focus. And so you go from one high to another in that field or whatever it might be, hoping that that'll give you some level of, of hope and satisfaction. That's why people get so upset when their team loses and doesn't go on to the playoffs or the championship because it, it somehow it takes some of their own heart away. You know, they're so disappointed and they get depressed over it when really in the long run it's just a game. It's where people get, uh, I, I could go on about that. I'll just stop right there. <laughs> it's getting lost in, in, in the world of entertainment and sports and technology and, and all sorts of things where that becomes like, primary importance and there's no urgency spiritually dissipation or he talks about drunkenness drunkenness is living a, a life to numb your pain it, it's not just alcohol it could be drugs as well it's living a life to numb the pain because life can get really painful it can get painful physically it can get painful uh, emotionally, it can get painful relationally, and you have a broken heart, and you just want the pain to go away. You just want to numb the pain. And so that leads eventually to addiction. And so no longer are you in charge of your life, and now the addiction is in charge of your life. No longer is the spirit controlling your life, but now the addiction is controlling your life. And no longer is it about God, but it's about feeding that addiction. And I, I know, um, as, as every one of us in this room knows, that when we have pain of one form or another, we just want to get rid of it. We, we just want it gone. And we're willing to, to, to help with that at times. And then we get in a mess if we go too far with that. I mean, this is just a simple illustration of that. But um, just recently I went to the dentist. I've always struggled with going to the dentist. I've, I've had my own fears with the dentist. I you know, anxiety issues and stuff like that. I mean, a number of years ago, I was in the middle of a root canal and I bolted and left. <laughs> Not good. About 20 minutes later, I came, came back, uh, you know, and finished it up. Uh, a few months later, I went back to the same dentist and there was this kid screaming his head off and, and the lady working on, on my teeth said, we call him Little Mikey. Uh, <laughs> I've been doing really good uh, for years now. I've been doing really good. I have a great dentist, and he's a great guy. And, and um, anyway, they, they do all they can to make me feel comfortable and all that. And, and so just a few weeks ago, I had to get a, a filling. And I woke up in the morning, and right away I was all anxious. I'm like, oh, no, this is how he used to feel years ago. I mean, what's going on? Why, why all, after all this time am I feeling this? And, and I went to the dentist, and he lowered me down, and, and I just went, oh. And pretty soon I'm like, I can't do it. I can't do it which is really embarrassing to do. And, and he said, would you like some nitrous? You know, like the, the old-fashioned laughing gas. I'm like, yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> and so they put the little thing on my nose, and, and, and I had nitrous. And, it, and I said afterwards, I said, I said, you got to be really careful with this stuff. He goes, yeah, it could be really addicting. And it's like, because I'm thinking, if I have a really bad day, I like to want to come to the dentist and get some nitrous. <laughs> Why? Because it numbs the pain. It takes the pain away. 
And, and Jesus said, and there's going to be people that are so focused on, on all of their pursuits and all that, they're going to be focused on drunkenness. They're going to be so focused on numbing the pain. And he says, and they're going to be focused on the cares of this, of this world, the cares of this life. That's the basic stuff we deal with on a daily basis, right? It's, it's our career, it's finances, it's, it's uh, basic maintenance around the house. You've got you know, to mow, and, and, and you've got you to cook, and you've got to clean, and, and all those kind of things. The, the basic maintenance of, of life, the basic cares of this world, and we get so focused on all that stuff. We get so focused on dissipation, drunkenness, and the cares of this world that we have no focus on Jesus. We're completely distracted. And he says, and then it's going to come the day when I'm going to show up and you're not ready. It's not because you're a horrible person. It's not because you're full of sin. It's because you're focused on other stuff. And you won't be ready. He says in verse 34, Jesus says, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. You know, it's like the mouse, you know, going through the, the, the house and all of a sudden, hey, look at this. Score, piece of cheese. Life is good. Go up to nibble on it and wham. Didn't see it coming. And we do that, don't we? We just kind of la, la, la through life. Everything's okay. We've got a few struggles here and there. But overall, things are good, and we are not focused at all on the coming of Jesus. We don't even think about him coming, and then one day, boom, here he's going to come. And we're not ready. Our hearts aren't ready. We're, li we're living with a focus without him. We're living in sin. We're not clean before him, whatever it might be. And, and, and all of a sudden, he comes, and oh, my goodness. So Jesus says, stay awake at all times. Praying, verse 36. He's not saying never sleep because he gave us the gift of sleep. It's, it's nice. He's saying have a posture of spiritual alertness all the time. Always being ready and pray. Why pray? He says praying that you may have strength. Verse 36. But stay awake at all times praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place, all the things from the end times, all the difficult things that are going to go on, and to stand before the Son of Man. Pray to have strength to go through this time and pray that you'll be prepared and ready to stand before the Son of Man when He comes back. As I shared with you several times in the last few months, I've made it a high priority when I prepare these sermons to, to live the sermon, to not prepare a sermon for you, but to prepare a sermon for me more than anybody. And I had to ask myself a difficult question this week that I'm now going to pass on to you, for you to ask yourself, and that is this. Do you really want Jesus to come back in your lifetime? Because I'm going to be honest, there have been many times in my life when I have had this thought. I don't want to go through the end times. And on top of that, I'm going to be in heaven forever. And so I want to have a full life. Be able to live my life till I'm old and, and then go. I, I want to have both. I'm just being honest. But I know deep down that when I see Jesus and when I get to be in heaven, I'm going to go, what was I thinking? I could have been here. I mean, this place is so much superior to where I've come from. And in the presence of Almighty God, what was I ever thinking to think that I would want to stay in the world? But while we're in the world, we hold on to the world and the things of the world and the focuses of the world. And we're like, why don't you come back in another generation, but not mine? <laughs> you know, it's the single person who says, Lord, I want you to come back, but not until I'm married. 
And as a young marriage, you say, I want you to come back, but not until after I've had some kids. <laughs> then you have the kids. <laughs> Or it's the, the person who's in the master's program working their tail off to, to pay their bills and to study. And it's like, Lord, I want you to come back, but not until I've, I've been in my career path. Or the person in the career path that says, you know what, Lord, I want you to come back, but not until I accomplish some of the goals that I have in my career path. Or the person who's about to retire to say, you know what, I really, Lord, want you to come back, but not until I've retired and enjoyed life for a few years without work. Lord, I want you to come back, but... And if that's what's in your heart, you're not ready. I get it. But you're not ready. You're ready when you think, above all of the pursuits I have and all the things that are ahead of me, more than anything else I want is to meet Jesus and to be with him and to go to heaven and to have such a developed, deep love relationship with him that you can't wait for his return. You know, when we're in the midst of pain, we want his return. When things are lousy, we want his return. But when things are good, we're like, ah, just kind of hold off for a while, would you? And it just says that we're so entrenched in the things of this earth, dissipation, drunkenness, and the cares of this world. From time to time, in our home, we will have a special guest come, and our, our kids hate that. They don't hate the guests, but they hate the preparation for the guests. So if you come to our house and there's not a lot of special preparation, you're family, so that's... That's good, but, but for some people, it's like, we got to get the, the yard all done, and that's pretty much my job, and then it's clean the house and all that. I remember in the house I grew up in, when we would have a special guest, my mom would clean the, the bathroom that was the kid's bathroom, but it was also the guest bathroom, and she just put a, a piece of paper on there with, a, with one big word on the paper, no. <laughs> that was for us kids, no. I cleaned it, you're not going in there and messing it up. So there's a lot of preparation that goes into somebody that, that, that comes. Basically what we do is we, we get things that are out of whack, we get, them, we get them right. That's what we do. We get the yard straightened up, we get the house straightened up, we, we shower and smell good. We get what's out of whack right, and all the other stuff we then we put in the laundry room and close the door. But <laughs> <laughs> And Jesus says, you need to get ready for me. Those things that are out of place, that are out of place in your life, you need to get right. And the relationship that is not truly as important as it should be to you needs to become your primary priority. And that's me, he says. And there needs to be a, an urgency spiritually to follow me with all your heart. And that no day could be better than the day that I come back. I mean, can you imagine seeing him in the clouds and go, wait, 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 i got a soccer game at three. Can you hold off? Huh. No, when he comes, it's like you drop everything because this is highest priority. He's your highest priority. Are you ready? If you're not ready, you need to believe, first of all. If you do not believe, you need to believe. You need to believe that Jesus is indeed the Son of God and he's coming back again. You need to submit to him and to ask for the forgiveness of your sins and invite him into your life. And you will have the gift of eternal life. That's how you get that. And on the day when he comes back, it'll be a great day for you versus the day of gloom and doom. If you want to know more about that, we have uh, some, some tables out in the lobby. It says, I said yes. You can't miss it. If you go out there, there are people there that would love to talk to you about your, your faith and to pray with you a prayer to, to have you receive Jesus and to be prepared for his coming. We also have a class called Starting Point. It's a class where you can go no matter where you are in your journey of faith and you might not know hardly anything about God and you can come and learn the basics and try to discover who Jesus is. So if you don't believe, you need to believe. If you do believe, you need to get things right. 
You need, you need to, to repent of, of, of the, all the cares of this world that have become your primary importance, and you need to set those aside and make him your primary importance. And in that, you develop a relationship that is so close and dear that you can't wait for his return. It's, it's like a dear, dear friend or a family member has gone away for a long time. They're going to come back. You can't wait for them to come back. You, you go to the airport early. You're waiting. You, you, when they come, you give them a huge hug. It's, it's a wonderful moment as, as you see each other once again. It's that kind of a, of a sense where you have such a deep relationship with Jesus Christ that you just can't wait for his return. To be ready. To be prepared. Let's pray. Lord, it's so easy to, to get focused on that which is not of primary importance. And we make it primary importance. And we don't have an urgency in our life spiritually. And we get focused on all sorts of stuff that, that really in the long run doesn't matter. And then that day is going to come when you're going to come back and it'd be terrible if we're followers of you and we're not ready. We're like, wait, 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 I, I need to get things right. But Lord, let's get, help us get ready. For those in this room who do not believe, Lord, may you draw them to you to believe. May they pray that prayer of, 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 of salvation where they ask for you to come into their life. They believe in you as the Son of God, that you are going to come back, and that's all real and true. And Lord, thank you for the forgiveness of sins for those who ask for forgiveness and the gift of eternal life that you give to those who ask for it. Lord, for those in this room who are followers of, of you, that honest to be truth, they're not ready for you. They don't think about you in these ways at all. They, they're, they're so focused on their own life and their own pursuits. If they were to be honest, they'd say, you know what? Don't come yet. There's too many other things I want to do and accomplish and be a part of. Lord, for those, for those not only thoughts, but those actions that we've had, we repent of that, Lord. We ask your forgiveness. We want to be ready for your return, and we want to be focused on you more than any other pursuit or thing. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You're the God of the universe, and, and you need to be far more important. And Lord, I pray that we grow so close to you that more than anything else in this world, more than marriage or a career or, or good health or anything, Lord, more than any of that, we want you. We want you. And so, Lord, we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who will return again.